today's lesson. We're going to focus on uh, the ears and how you hear. And we're also going to include in that uh, information about how you balance yourself, both a dynamic balance and static equilibrium. We're going to start with the ear. Now, in the ear, you have to remember that we do have two senses there, hearing and equilibrium. Now, receptors are classed by different ways. You know, for example, uh, the rods and cones in your eye. We classify those as photoreceptors because they respond to light. In other words, when light strikes the photoreceptors, they will generate an action potential which carries the nerve impulse to the optic region of the brain. Well, in the, both hearing and balance, these are mechanoreceptors, which means that they are going to be stimulated by some mechanical means. Something has to bend some little tiny hairs, and that bending generates an action potential, which sends nerve impulses to the brain, and the brain separates out the hearing ones and the balanced ones. Now, to do this, there are two different organs involved with you know, balance and hearing. And today's uh, discussion, we're going to look at each one of those. Now, the ear is divided into three regions. This slide, we're going to deal with the external ear. Now, the external ear is involved only in hearing. To be more specific, it's only involved with the transfer of sound waves from the outside to the eardrum. So our structures here involve the pinna, or the external portion that we see. Uh, some, portion, some textbooks refer to this as the oracle. And again, for those of you that uh, it's kind of hard to see on these, it's this part of your ear right here. I've also seen some textbooks classify this whole thing as the earlobe. More commonly, we call this portion down here the earlobe. But I've seen some textbooks that actually list this as a lobule. Now, what's it composed out of? Well, these cells right here are all fat. So if you are getting pierced ears or something, you know, why do they bleed? Well, you've got a lot of uh, blood vessels running through any kind of fat tissue. Okay, then why doesn't it hurt so much? I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. Well, I understand it does. But you do have nerves there and your skin receptors. Uh, the rest of the ear is mostly uh, elastic cartilage. That elastic cartilage allows the ear to, to bend, be bent over, and when the pressure is released, it snaps back up. Now, the second part of the external ear is the external auditory canal. That's this part right here. Right here. External auditory canal. Now, your textbook has this whole phrase here, external acoustic medius. You can simply call it the auditory canal. Uh, but keep that separate because if we start talking about the middle ear, we're going to have a structure called the auditory tube. Okay, we're going to talk about this on the next slide. But the ears, this external ear's function is to gather sound waves and channel them towards the eardrum. So what makes up the external ear? just these structures, and the external ear ends at the eardrum. Now, some people have wondered why the ear has all these little curves and helices to it. What biologists have figured out was that having these little curves like this actually affects the way the uh, sound is tr channeled in. It gives us the ability to, to tell direction of sound. If you've ever been had had a firecracker go off behind you and to your right, well, because of the way the ear is designed, you turn your head back and to the right because you can tell the direction. Without that, you may not be able to tell direction quite so well, but again, our brains adapt other ways to figure those things out. The second part of the ear is called the middle ear, or the tympanic cavity. Uh, most people have trouble pronouncing this, but I tell them, think about in the orchestra, those big kettle drums, they're called timpanies. 
you know, because timpani, tympanic should help you remember those out here. Main thing to remember about here is that in this air-filled cavity, and it is air-filled, you've got three bones. Now on the test, I've always put them all up here together. The hammer or malus, the Latin name and the English name, incus or anvil, and the stapes or stirrup. And on the test, I put all I put both terms up there, so you shouldn't get confused on those. But these three bones trans are attached one at a time, all held together by ligaments, and their job is to transfer the vibrations from the eardrum all the way to the uh, uh, oval window of the next part of the vestibule. We'll come to that in just a little bit. It starts with the vibrations from the eardrum. Whatever frequency the sound waves are traveling, when they hit the eardrum, the eardrum will vibrate at the same frequency. Now the hammer is, is directly attached to that. And as the eardrum moves, so does the hammer. And because the hammer is attached to the anvil, the anvil will vibrate at the same frequency. And since the anvil is attached to the stapes, or stirrup, it will also vibrate at the same frequency. So the frequency is passed unchanged from where the sound first hits the tympanic membrane all the way through the uh, stirrup. So the sound waves are transferred and amplified. Now attached to the hammer and the stirrup, you have two of the smallest muscles of your body. These muscles are there attaching to the hammer and the stirrup to prevent the vibrations of really loud noises from getting excessive and causing ear damage. Let's say, for example, you were standing at the side of a curb, and along comes a fire engine. As it's passing, you know the sound is getting a lot louder. And these muscles inside your ear are tightening up on those bones to keep them from vibrating too hard and causing ear damage. And they're pretty fast acting, really, because they will respond even in the event of a firecracker going off uh, 10 feet from your foot or something and scaring the heck out of you. They will respond fast enough to tighten up and prevent the eardrum from being ruptured. Now, excessively loud noises, obviously, like 120 decibels, not going to be any good. Now the other structure I have on here for the middle ear that I didn't have room on the slide to actually put a separate uh, notion up here, but you can, you can see it right here. There is a canal that connects from the middle ear all the way down to the throat. This in your textbook, your textbook uses this term, term the pharyngeotympanic tube. Older textbooks use auditory tube and textbooks from my generation call it the Eustachian tube. If you're going to get your parents to help you with this, they might know that Eustachian tube better. Uh, for the testing purposes, I put it on there, uh, pharyngeotympanic. Those of you that are really going into your textbook to study, but I've also put auditory in parentheses. But just make sure you keep it straight here between auditory tube, which is going from the throat to the middle ear, and the auditory canal. Canal tube. The purpose of this tube is to equalize the air pressure. As an example, if you are going up in altitude in a non-pressurized airplane, your, ear, your middle ear is going to be have an air pressure on the inside of about 14.7 pounds per square inch. Every 1,000 feet you go up, that drops significantly. So let's say you go up 2,000 feet in a non-pressurized airplane. Well, what's going to happen is the air pressure surrounding your ear, the air pressure out here, is going to be much less than 14.7 pounds. Back here, 14.7 pounds. So the eardrum is going to be pushed outward and pushed really tight. So any sounds you hear the, are going to be muffled because the eardrum's not going to be free to vibrate. That's why a lot of times they'll ask you to chew gum, yawn, or something. Because when you chew gum, 
that chewing gum action opens up this auditory tube. Because normally it lays flat down against your side. It opens it up, and the air pressure quickly equalizes. If you, and even in pressurized airplanes, you may have a problem there with the ears popping when you get up around uh, 45, 30, 45,000 feet cruising altitude of some of those, of those passenger jets. The third part of the ear is the inner ear. Uh, Boy laboreth basically like a maze. That's what a labyrinth is. It's a fancy word for a maze. And this whole maze of bones is cut out from the temporal bone. Uh, the models we have here in class, we've lost part of it here, but uh, so it kind of gives you, you have to kind of stretch your imagination that this bone right here, right through here, is the temporal bone. Imagine that there's a hollowed out cavity with membranes all lining the inside of it that's going to house both your hearing and your equilibrium organs. It's going to house the cochlea. Cochlea is Latin for snail. Cochlea is that portion back here that winds around, twists around, and basically looks like a snail. It's also got a section called the vestibule, which we're going to talk about in the next couple slides. The vestibule is divided into two portions, the utricle and the saccule. This is going to contain uh, your organs, uh, your structures for uh, static equilibrium. This is how you're going to tell whether your head is upright or tipped down within these structures. Finally, you're also going to have three semicircular canals. Prefix semi means half, so these are half circles. These are going to house the organs for your dynamic equilibrium. They're going to help you detect motion in all different planes.